Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioner. Say that three times. Okay. Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioner. Who's on a mission to help one billion people live a healthier lifestyle. Ben is the author of three best-selling books. As a former obese man, Ben is now the go-to source when it comes to holistic health. Longevity, anti-aging, functional fitness, and fat loss. He is known as the health detective because he investigates dysfunction and educates, not medicate, to bring the body back to normal function. Ben is considered a ketogenic and intermittent fasting expert amongst his, amongst his peers. So now I'd like to welcome to the center here, put your hands together for Mr. Ben Azadi. Of what he had been doing up until that point. 
so everything in his life changed. Relationships, finances. He started to be happier because he did the exact opposite of what he had been doing up until that point. So what I am going to tell you is that what you see the government promote, mainstream media, articles on Facebook, do the complete opposite, the George Costanza effect, and you're going to be going down the right direction. I want to acknowledge, uh, I acknowledge Brand and Angie already, because they were amazing. I also want to acknowledge Laz is going to be speaking next. I don't know where he went. Oh, there he is. Uh, Pablo is doing an amazing job. The venue and uh, MC Squared, and also my girlfriend, Natasia. And <laughs> she helped put the bags together, by the way. She was here helping out. And also all of you, we're in Linwood, there's so many things to do, we can get trash, we can get a hammer, we can do Netflix, there's so many things you can do tonight, but you're here. So thank you, I acknowledge every single one of you for investing in yourself, investing in your future self, and your future self will thank you for being here, I know. Everybody grab your right hand like this, put it over your heart, let's take a deep breath in. Exhale. One more time in. Exhale. You feel your heartbeat? 150,000 people didn't get that today. They took their last heartbeat. 150,000 people die every single day. That's the number. As I've been on here for what, five minutes, maybe less? Hundreds and thousands of people have died all across the world. So just knowing that, knowing that your heart is beating, that alone is something to be grateful for. Gratitude, Brant talked about it. Gratitude is the biggest healer in this world. Love and gratitude. Because you can be doing all the things I'm going to teach you a little bit about keto and fasting and all hormones and insulin and metabolic flexibility and all these cool things. But if you don't have love and gratitude, you cannot heal a body you hate. You gotta love yourself. You gotta love people in your life who have done bad things to you. And you gotta just send love bombs to everybody. I find myself in my car, driving. I'm listening to an audio book or listening to a podcast and I turn it off and I have a gratitude brand page. I'm saying thank you for this, thank you for that, thank you for things I have not accomplished but I'm feeling like if I already accomplished it. And I tell you what, gratitude has changed my life. Gratitude continues to change my life. And there, it's such a powerful healer. So powerful. So when we look around in America, we see a lot of people who are sick. We see a lot of people who are unhealthy. The system is broken. Not only that, the system is rigged against us. It is set up for us to be on what I call the medical treadmill, where we are on prescription, prescription surgery in between prescription, prescription, and they don't want to kill us. I'm not saying that. They want us to live a long life. Quality of life, not so much. Long life, yes. So we're keeping people alive longer, but their quality of life is deteriorating. They're on this medical treadmill, but eventually they get what? Thrown off that treadmill, and that's when they pass away, that's when they die. So what if I told you this? The same food in a hospital that they're feeding chemo patients is the same food that causes cancer. Amen. The same diet that the American Diabetes Association promotes is the same diet that causes diabetes. What if I told you that more people die from heart attacks and heart disease with normal to low cholesterol than with high cholesterol. See, the fact of the matter is that we don't die, we're killing ourselves. It's just happening so slowly that it's not being classified as a suicide. I think we should pay our doctors every month we're healthy and not pay them when we're not healthy. What do you think about that? Right? What is this health care? It's not health care. It's, it's sick care. It, it's set up and it's a money-making cash money. Thank you. Amen. The same diet 
that the American Diabetes Association promotes is the same diet that causes diabetes. What if I told you that more people die from heart attacks and heart disease with normal to low cholesterol than with high cholesterol? See, the fact of the matter is that we don't die, we're killing ourselves. It's just happening so slowly that it's not being classified as a suicide. I think we should pay our doctors every month we're healthy and not pay them when we're not healthy. What do you think about that? Right? What is this health care? It's not health care. It's, it's sick care. It, it's set up and it's a money-making cash cow. And I saw this happen with my father. Some of you know my story of my father. See, my father had type 2 diabetes. He, he immigrated to America from Iran back in the 1970s with my mom. And he ate the standard American diet, aka the stupid American diet. High sugar, high carbs, low fat, which is what they still teach, by the way, in, in colleges and doctors and nutritionists still teach this. So my dad got type 2 diabetes. And I remember my entire life watching my dad deal with type 2 diabetes before I understood, before I was even in the health space. And I watched his health deteriorate year after year, gain more weight. And I would take him to his doctor's appointments every month. And I would take him to Publix to go shopping for him every week. And I would fill up his medication every single week, like clockwork, week by week, month by month, for years and years and years. I did everything the doctors told me to do. Buy him these fiber one bars, they said. G2 sugar-free Gatorade, they said. And I listened to them, because I was not a free thinker back then. I, I trusted them. I put my faith in the doctors. And it was about six years ago now that he was in such bad shape. I remember he, my dad called me, and he told me he was having trouble walking. You see, when you have diabetes, it gets to a point where you're getting nerve damage, and it's called diabetic neuropathy. And if you don't deal with it, they end up amputating your feet so you don't go gangrene. That's the next step. So he was so scared about getting his foot amputated, he called me and he told me he couldn't walk. He was hobbling around his apartment. So I went to my mom and I picked him up, took him to the emergency room. My dad was so stressed out about being in the emergency room because he thought he was going to get his feet amputated that in the hospital, my dad suffered a massive stroke and he lost the ability to speak. He lost the entire right side to function on his right side. And here's something even crazy, crazier. They didn't even know he was having a stroke. It took him two days. I walked in and visited him two, late, two days later and I said, there's something not right with my dad. They ran a test, their dad suffered a stroke. He's never gonna talk again. He's never gonna move his arm again. So then they transferred my dad to a hospice facility, and I visited my dad every single month, month after month after month. And every time I went to go visit my dad, I watched his body shrink before my eyes, his bones shrink, the light just gets sucked out of him. It was a very difficult time in my life, and I, and I don't want anybody to have to go through anything similar to that. So it was nine months into this, my dad has been in this bed, not able to move for nine months as his body deteriorates. And it was August 12, 2014, Monday night, where I went to go visit him like I did every single week. But this time he was in the worst shape that I had ever seen him in. He was throwing up on himself, he was convulsing, he was shaking. And I didn't know what to do. I was just staring at my dad, just praying, looking at the hope, the hopelessness in his eyes. I didn't know what to do. I was just distraught. And I stayed there with him for a few hours, and they, they cleaned him up, and he looked a lot better that night. And I walked up to my dad, and I, I kissed him on the forehead, and I told him that I'm always going to be his son, he's always going to be my dad, and I love him. And I kissed him again, and I said, hasta la vista, baby, which he used to always say to me that I was a kid from Terminator. So I went home that night. And I prayed every single night, but this night, my prayer was different. I was in my shower, and I was saying the same words I said for months in that shower, every single night, which was 
please end my father's suffering. He suffered enough. Please end my father's suffering. He suffered enough. And I went to bed. The next day, less than 24 hours, so it was Tuesday, 12 p.m., I got a phone call. And I looked at my phone, and it's the hospital. And my heart just, just sunk in my chest. I knew something was up. So I pick up the phone, and it's my father's nurse letting me know that my father stopped breathing that morning, and he's gone. I sat there on my couch, and I was happy that my dad was no longer in pain. And I was so sad that my one and only father is gone. We only get one mom, we only get one dad. And I, I set out to find out what happened to my dad. I started reading books. I started taking courses. I started learning from people who are actually in the health space doing amazing things. And I've come to find that the information I share tonight in my books, on my podcast, it's the same information that would have saved my father's life. I know that. I get that. I also know that I was given that mountain so I can show the world this mountain can be built. I'm on a mission to educate one billion people on planet Earth. And you have to know, you have to understand this. You are in control of your future. You are superhuman. You have amazing powers that have been lying dormant inside of you, and we're gonna extract it. Angie and Brent are already extracted, extracted some of it. I can see it in your faces. Just wait, we got a lot more. So we need, to, we need to really start to think. I mean, really think. Brent said 60,000 thoughts per day. I, I, I agree with that. And most of them, 95% of them, are not original thoughts. They're the same thoughts that we thought the day before, the month before, the year before. Nobody thinks. Nobody really thinks. 2% of the population think. 3% of the population may think they think. And 95% of the population would rather die than think. <laughs> I wasn't thinking when I was going through that with my dad. Now I am. I'm aware of my thoughts. And I'm getting better at it. Getting really good at it. So this information, I mean, I could, just like a, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make that horse drink, I can lead you to this information, but I can't make you think. I'm challenging you to really think, to take this information and educate yourself and do some research. Because I know that if you just take a couple things here that I'm sharing, it's going to make a difference for you. I don't want any single person in this room to have to go through what I went through with my dad. And I gave you the stats. People are dealing with this every single day. There's people in here that I saw crying when I was sharing my story, and I just know you have a similar story. We want to be proactive, not reactive. When we look at the 21st century, the illiterate of the 21st century is not those who cannot read and write. It's those who cannot learn something, school, unlearn something, and then relearn what actually works. That's a true illiterate. Somebody who cannot do that. So Brent talked about it. We don't learn this stuff at school. The system is set up. Who funds, and, and please don't take offense to this, 40% of the funding for the Academy of Dietitian and, and Nutrition comes from Coca-Cola, General Mills, and big food companies. 40%, okay? So when you have somebody, I'm just calling them out right now. You want to lose weight? Let's count your calories. It's all about our math equation. Your body is like a calculator. It's a red flag. Go the, go the opposite direction, because they don't understand the human body. I want you to understand this. You are so powerful. So freaking powerful, you have no idea. I have no idea how powerful I am. I'm going to share a couple stories with you to illustrate just how powerful you are. There was this woman with her son in California. She 
he was driving on the highway, and the car had a flat tire. They pulled over to the road. The son was helping the mom with the flat tire. They put the car on a lift. The son went underneath that lift. He started repairing the tire. The lift broke, and the car fell on top of the chest of the son. And he was suffocating. He, he couldn't breathe. And the mom was there. There was not enough time for her to call an ambulance. He was done, and, it was, and in a matter of seconds, he would have been gone. So this 95-pound woman lifted up the car and took her son from underneath it. Are you kidding me? That's a true story. Another story for you. A gentleman named Cliff Young, 61-year-old Australian, back in the 1970s. He was a farmer who decided to run a famous race in Australia that was a 600-mile race that typically takes six and a half days to complete. He shows up day one of the race. The media was there. He showed up in overalls and boots. <laughs> the media was asking him, do you know what you're doing? Have you ever trained for this? He had never trained for a marathon, for a 600 mile race. But he owned a farm and he said, I run around a lot with my sheep and I do some herding. I should be good. I'm active. <laughs> he never read Runner's Magazine or studied it. There was no Google back then. So the race started, and this is Cliff Young just going about like this. It's called the Cliff Young Shuffle now. And everybody passed this guy. Every single person passed this guy. And he just kept going. You see, the way he didn't know this though. He didn't know this one thing. He didn't know you're supposed to run for 18 hours straight and then sleep and rest for six hours. So 18 hours into this, he's looking around thinking everybody's just gone, but everybody was actually sleeping. And he just kept going and going. And he ran for five and a half days nonstop and he broke the world record by 12 hours. <laughs> Have you guys heard of Roger Bannister? Yes. The four minute mile? Back in the day, doctors said, it is impossible to run a four minute mile. The heart is not strong enough. The body is not capable of running a four minute mile. So Roger Bannister, he stopped believing in the experts and he started believing in Roger Bannister and he ran a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> what happened months after that? Dozens and dozens of other people ran that mile in less than four minutes. You see, sometimes it's not what you don't know that's holding you back. It's what you think you know that ain't so that's really holding you back. So when you have a feeling of, I want to get healthy, I want to start a new business, I want to talk to that guy, I want to talk to that girl, I want to do this, and then you have these self-limiting beliefs, understand that those self-limiting beliefs have nothing to do with who you are or your potential. It has everything to do with your conditioning, your paradigm. And I want to illustrate what I mean by your conditioning, your paradigm. Picture a baby elephant in Africa. So you have this picture in your mind? This baby elephant is born into this world and they immediately put this elephant to work. All day long, this baby elephant is put to work. At the end of a long day's work, they put these shackles and chain around the ankle, stake it to the ground, and keeps it keeps that elephant staying put all night long. And it tries to break away, but it's a baby elephant. It's not strong enough. Years later, this same baby elephant is now a full-grown beast, capable of pulling loaded railroad track or railroad carts, vehicles, and it's a full beast, full-grown beast. They put that same elephant to work, full day work, they put the same chains and shackles around its ankle and stake it to the ground and they leave that elephant there overnight. This beast, it can easily pull away and break free, but it's been conditioned to believe it's stuck there. That elephant would not try to escape. In fact, it would stay there until it dies because of its conditioning. So you can't escape a prison if you don't know you're in one. So you probably heard this before. It's in my genetics, it's in my future now. Heart disease runs in my family. Cancer runs in my family. I'm here to tell you that your genes are not your future. 
When you're bored, your jeans load the gun, but you determine whether or not you pull the trigger on those jeans. I'm going to show you what I mean. So we're made up, this is just a circle, you can't see it. We're made up of trillions of cells. Trillions, 70 trillion cells. Every cell has around it something called the cell membrane. The cell membrane, it's the bodyguard of your DNA, which is in your cells. Every cell has these receptor sites. Think of these receptor sites as cell phone antenna signals. They're receiving signals from your hormones. They're getting oxygen into your cells. They're getting nutrients into your cells. We also have something in your cells called mitochondria, which is the energy power plant of your cells. It creates energy. We were designed so amazingly. I mean, our creator knew what he was doing. So we have our hormones communicating communicating to ourselves, and it's just a well-oiled machine. We take food, we use nutrients, we get rid of what we don't need, we burn fat, we feel good, we live to 120 years old, disease-free, which is the way we were designed to be, 120 years old, disease-free. However, something happens. Our lifestyle, the food we eat, the stupid American diet, our thoughts as well, that creates Inflammation around our cells. I'm just drawing these red lines around our cells. You can't see it. Inflammation. Then, we have our hormones. They can't get in. They're blocked. So we have our hormones that can't get in, and then we have dysfunction that occurs. So what are some symptoms that people experience? Shout it out. What are some symptoms that people experience? Wait, so, weight gain, restlessness, brain fog, depression, depression, brain fog, got it? IBS. IBS, come on, what, what else? Sleep? Infertility. Infertility, yep. So, you can see that this list can go on and on and on. I mean, there's thousands of, there's thousands of things people could experience. Is the problem the symptom, or is the problem what's going on here with the cells? The cells. The cells. The cells. So when you go to a conventional doctor, they're going to start treating your symptoms, and you might feel better short term, right, if they give you hormones, because you have a hormone problem, you have your low T, or whatever it is, and you might feel better at first. That's like, give you an example, giving somebody hormones just to fix their problem. If you're screaming at me, but I have my fingers in my ears and I can't hear you, and then you shout at me, it might work at first. You shout at me and it, it works short term. But what happens if I, you keep screaming at me? And louder and louder and louder. I go more deaf. You keep giving somebody more hormones, they become more blunted and it does not solve the problems. So chasing symptoms are what intellectuals do. Einstein said intellectuals solve problems, symptoms, Geniuses prevent them. You're all geniuses here. My goal is to empower you to understand that you're a genius. So you can walk here knowing that your genes do not determine your future. You determine your future. If you can find out what is the cause of the inflammation, then a side effect is the, the symptoms go away. You might not notice about me, I was obese for most of my life. For 24 years of my life, I was obese, okay? I weighed 80 pounds heavier than you can see right now. I didn't have a weight problem. I had a weight symptom. So what are two powerful ways to bring down inflammation? You probably don't know what I'm gonna say. Fasting. Fasting is one of them, which I'm gonna get to shortly, and then I'm gonna wrap it up here. How much? Keto is a powerful tool. The keto diet. How many of you have heard of the keto diet? Woohoo! Yes. <laughs> Dina and her husband drove five hours to be here, by the way. Amazing. Woo! Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Carlos, Carlos reversed his diabetes in six months with keto. Yes! <laughs> if you go to the Diabetes Association website, 
if you look up how you re reverse your diabetes, what would, what would it say? It's going to say, yeah, you cannot yeah. reverse it. It's a progressive and chronic disease that we can manage. <laughs> <laughs> what a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> okay, so let me just get through this. I have a, an analogy to compare, to share. When, and keto I love as a tool. By the way, keto, just because it's trending, it's not a fad. Keto is a fact. It's been around since forever, for millions of years. Being in ketosis has been around for millions of years. The way I teach it is the way our ancestors would have used keto. To get fat adapted, to reset your metabolism, and then get out of ketosis. You don't want to stay there. That's putting yourself in a box. So I'm not a dogmatic person about keto. I think it's a powerful tool in the toolbox. If you're burning sugar as your primary fuel source, it creates a lot of inflammation around your cells, and it tells your DNA to turn on bad genes. Because genes are like the lights here. You turn them on, turn them off. When you have inflammation, it turns on the bad genes. So when you're burning sugar, it's a toxic fuel source to your cells. So when you're eating every two to three hours, eating high carbs, you're in creating inflammation. You're aging yourself faster, essentially. Think of burning sugar. Think of burning sugar as a diesel truck that is speeding through I-95 with a lot of toxic smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe. That's what's happening in your cells when you're burning sugar as your primary fuel source. Let's say you learn all about keto, you start watching my YouTube videos, and you start getting yourself into ketosis. And now you're burning fat and producing ketones. That's like a beautiful Tesla. It's going to cruise through the highway with no smoke coming out of its exhaust pipe. Yeah. Would you rather be a diesel truck or a Tesla? Tesla. Add to that fasting. Intermittent fasting. Fasting is one of the most powerful tools. And I could give a lecture on seven hours just on fasting, but I'm almost out of time here. I just want to give you two reasons why fasting is so powerful. Number one, it's not weight loss. And we're not focusing on weight loss at all. We focus on health. Because you get healthy to lose weight, you don't lose weight to get healthy. So when you fast, your body is so freaking smart, it turns off this switch called autophagy, which stands for self-eating. Think of Pac-Man going through your body. And it goes for the damaged stuff first, the damaged mitochondria, the damaged DNA. And it eats that for fuel. That's why, and I'll give you an example real quick. If this was a refrigerator right here, and we had, I had groceries inside of it, best used by a specific date, what's going to happen if I let all of those groceries expire in that fridge, and then I go to Publix, and I buy new groceries, and I come back here, open up the fridge, put those groceries, the new ones, in front of the old ones, and just close the door? What's going to happen in that fridge? It's going to rot. It's going to be disgusting. There's going to be disease. It's going to be bacteria. The human body is like this refrigerator. We have proteins, we have DNA, we have mitochondria, and cells that need to be thrown out. In fact, 70 billion cells are required to be recycled every single day. And when you fast, you do that. That's why one of the top leaders in cancer research, Dr. Thomas Seafried, who wrote the book Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, his, this is quote, if you were to complete a seven day water only fast once per year, you would reduce your chances of any cancer by 95%. What were those numbers? What were the numbers you just said? You would reduce your chances of cancer by 95% after a seven day water fast. So you're probably thinking, what the hell? A seven day water fast? I am not going to do that. How could the human body even function? And I want to ask you a quick question. Don't answer if you know the answer and you've seen my work. Only answer if you're guessing, okay? I know that's a weird request. What, what do you think the world record, the Guinness World Record is for the longest recorded water fast? Give me some numbers. Shout it out. 26. 26? What? 30. 40. Anybody have higher? One year. 60, guys. What'd you say? 367 days. 367? Okay, so here's the answer. Here's the answer. 382 days. Yeah. You said 382? All right, nice. So you were second. You were close to. That was a morbidly obese, a morbidly obese Scottish man. He weighed 450 pounds, and he went on a medically supervised. That's a key word right there. Medically supervised 
water only fast for 382 days, and he went from 450 pounds to 180 pounds. All of his markers improved. His electrolytes were fine. He felt amazing. You see, that's just an extreme example to show you that, hey, you can skip that breakfast muffin. There's nothing to work <laughs> Okay, so when you make changes in your life, it's going to suck. When I was obese and I started working out, it sucked. Here's the formula. Suck, 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 success. <laughs> you got it? Look, listen, this is serious. This is serious. Because I, I laugh. You got to expect that you're going to achieve greatness. You got to expect it. People are expecting things not to work. Moses, if you know the story of Moses, he was out in the desert and he was digging his followers and he wanted to move into new land. But he wanted to change the consciousness of his followers before he brought them to a new land. So they're out in the desert, no rain in sight, they're all starving to death and dehydrated and they walk up to Moses and they're saying, Moses, we are going to die out here, there's no rain in sight. So Moses says, you go out there and you pray to your God. 24 hours later, still no rain. They walk back up to Moses and they say, Moses, God has forsaken us. And Moses looks around and he says, where are the ditches? And they look at him, what do you mean? If you expected there to be rain, you would have dug the ditches. You guys have to expect that it's going to work for you. If you want to lose 30 pounds, start buying clothes that's two or three sizes less. And start throwing out the clothes you know you're never going to go back to. you got to expect you're going to achieve it. I've been doing the opposite the first 24 years of my life. I was tiptoeing my way through life hoping to make it safely to death. Okay? I don't want you to live like that. I've been there. I was depressed on Google looking for ways to kill myself. And now, I'm on a mission inspired every day to help the world. Do you know where the richest place in the world is? The cemetery. That's where everybody takes their dreams, their goals, that book they wanted to write, that song they wanted to produce, that relationship they wanted to, to have. And it's buried there. So I want you to be in your grave when you're done with this human body, you're still on a spiritual journey, and be empty. And this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with. One of my favorite quotes from Gandhi. Your beliefs create your thoughts. Your thoughts create your words. Your words create your actions. Your actions create your habits. Your habits create your values. And your values create your destiny. Thank you all so much for your attention.